Hi, I'm Seth Mosley, and you are listening to or watching the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. We are live here in the Full Circle Music Studios. We are at our Full Circle Academy Songwriters Retreat. It's been an incredible weekend, and you're about to hear a panel with me and my team with Full Circle Music. It's, it's myself, Stacey Wilbur, who does VP, uh, she's the VP of Publishing at A&R, uh, X is VP of Production, Jericho VP of Operations, and then Logan is VP of Marketing. And you'll get to hear some things like why job titles are not important, um, what are the things that we love about Full Circle Music and the culture that we're creating that's different than any place else in our industry. And um, we just took a bunch of uh, really, really great audience questions. We dove into music marketing, we dove into branding, we dove into um, is it possible to have a sustainable songwriting career outside of living in Nashville, and many, many more great questions. So stick around to the end of the show. Uh, hit subscribe on our YouTube page, and if you're listening on podcasts, subscribe to us on iTunes. Leave us a good rating and a good review. That helps people uh, discover us and you know tell a friend about it. So uh, we'll just jump right in. We're live at the Songwriters Retreat at Full Circle Music Academy. Hi, this is Seth. We're live at the Songwriters Retreat, Full Circle Music Academy, with a live studio audience. <laughs> yeah. We have had an absolutely breathtaking, I'll say breathtaking, weekend. Um, <laughs> trying to use new synonyms, new adjectives. Um, but man, like seriously, just some of the some of the conversations I've been having, uh, just man, Ginny Owens, Tim Timmons, David Leonard from All Sons and Daughters, Hunter Brothers, and of course all the pros. I mean, it's been amazing. So mm -hmm. um, we're gonna, we're going to go through a panel with our team, and these are questions that um, you guys, the audience, have have asked, and we wanted to make sure we got all of the uh, really relevant ones answered. So. Um, I'll just start us off. First question is for me, and it's, what was the first song that you were proud of writing and why? Um, well, I'm going to take it back to, I'm going to take you all the way actually back to 1995. And no, I did not write a song in 1995 because I was six, seven, eight years old then. But I got a record from this band called Newsboys, um, and it was a record called Take Me to Your Leader. And it was my first CD I ever got. I had a, had a Walkman. And um, I would just stay up all night listening to this thing in my, in my room. I wouldn't sleep. I would just, just have, li uh, live and breathe these songs. And um, eventually got to see them live. That was life changing. And um, so fast forward to 2009, uh, had a song that we were working on. Uh, and it was called This Is Who I Am. It was, I was in a band at the time called Me In Motion and was producing other indie bands and kind of just couch surfing. I was trying to figure out, okay, should I make this move to Nashville? Um, can I afford to? And uh, somewhere along the lines, I, I, uh, I got to meet a guy named Wes who was manager and owner of this band Newsboys. And he basically hired me to produce an EP for his daughter with another co-producer. And um, we had this song around, it was called This Is Who I Am. And um, ultimately, he, he ended up hearing that. It was a song that was uh, we had done with another indie band. We were thinking about, is it a Me In Motion thing? Is it a their, their thing? Is it a, what do we do with it? Because it was a cool song. Um, and we were just like listening to like Toby Mac and Skillet, and like maybe we can try to get it to one of them. And uh, Wes heard it, and he was like, can we just try having you know Tate, Michael Tate, who was from the band DC Talk, second record I ever owned, um, can we have him try to sing on this thing? Because we're considering him as front man for Newsboys. So it's like. Sure, try it out, you know. And uh, a few tweaks later, we ended up changing the song title to Born Again. And that was my first, uh, I guess you'd say, hit that put me on the map. Um, and really, honestly, is the reason why Full Circle is called Full Circle. Because my first band that I, first CD I got when I was a little kid, all the way to the first label record, big hit that I produced was the same band. So. For me, it's just been a you know, crazy journey, God story after God story after God story of just him allowing me to work with these people. So I would say born again, probably for that purpose. So that was a great question. I don't know who asked that. But um, Stacy, 
What made you want to get into publishing and how did you get into it? Well, I actually didn't know anything about music publishing, um, but I was one of those nerdy people who growing up loved looking at the, um, the CD covers. I loved looking to see who wrote songs, who were the band members, who played drums, who were the background vocalists on um, different projects. So I just, I grew up for some reason just loving to, to, to know that information. And so when I moved to Nashville in 1994, um, my degree was actually in elementary education but that was the backup plan in case the music industry didn't work out. But I moved to Nashville in 1994 and um, just started meeting people. And it's all, I mean, we've talked a lot about relationships. It's all about relationships. And it really is because as I went to shows and um, kept showing up and going to things, I met a couple of people who introduced me to um, other people who I got a job as a receptionist at a, at a company on Music Row where I was there for a year and that job led me to this job, my first real job in the music industry at, at uh, EMI Christian, which is now Capital. And I didn't know what publishing was at the time. I just knew I loved music. I loved listening to music and going, oh, that song sounds like that would be great fit for this person. And so really it was Julie Corlew, um, who's a who's a songwriter? She was the the song plugger at the time at at EMI Christian, and she I was her assistant at EMI for basically three or four months until she left, and uh, she taught me everything. She let me go to meetings, and she um, would we would sit in meetings with uh, Susan Ashton and Twyla Paris and Stephen Kerr Chapman, and we would listen to songs, and it's like oh. I love this. This is so cool. Like this is this is what I'm supposed to do, and that's basically what I've been doing for the last 23 years. So, yeah, very good. X. Yes. Grammy-winning producer X O'Connor. <laughs> Desert Island. <laughs> Desert Island microphone preamp channel strip, either plug-in or analog, and it says can't be an SM7. We're getting nerdy here. Um, yeah, well, that's the microphone one's pretty easy. Uh, assuming budget is not a concern. Uh, U67 is great on everything. Sounds awesome on electric guitars, awesome on acoustic guitars, awesome on drums, awesome on vocals. Uh, so easily, U67, Desert Island mic. Uh, mic Pre, uh, I like the BAE 312s, the 500 series ones. Uh, they have a cool low mid warmth thing, but they're also real transparent like the APIs, so. We cut everything through. Our master vocal chain goes through it. Sound great on, again, acoustics, <laughs> electrics, bass guitars, everything. So, I mean, when I started out, I didn't have a ton of money. So everything I bought was about versatility. And API style stuff was on the top of it because you can use it on absolutely everything. Um, channel strip. Uh, I mean, the Neve stuff is awesome. You know, uh, 1073. I mean, assuming you don't want compression on the channel strip, I mean, nothing beats a Neve 1073 or a 1081. But yeah, I think, was there any more to it? All those are analog, but you can get the digital sides of them too. The, the uh, UAD ones, the 1073s and 1081s sound awesome. Make sure you get the non-legacy ones, like the ones you actually have to pay for because they do sound remarkably better. But yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I got. My answer was slightly less cool. My Desert Island, my Desert Island microphone was an iPhone. Which gives you a way off the island, hopefully. You also get a phone. <laughs> so, you can call Uber, you can book a flight. You can watch movies if you wanted to. Yeah, so. Very nice. Jericho. Yes. Sweet Jericho. Mm. How do you see the landscape of Christian music changing over the next five to ten years? Um... Well, with anything, with age, it's either one or two options. You get older and wiser or more ornery. Um, and so, realistically, though, I, I feel like the, I actually feel like Christian music is actually starting to break out of the square box that it's kind of been put in for a while, which is actually exciting. So, on that front, like, radio is kind of opening up some mindset, like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe these new sounds is kind of cool, you know what I mean? Like, so they're kind of embracing 
the regular world of uh, regular radio and that kind of stuff. So doors are opening and expanding on that. People are, every artist that comes around is always like, oh, I want to try something new. So I think with everybody doing it, um, sound wise, it's going to expand. And then on the digital format, like that's where it's going. So whether you like it or not, that's definitely where it needs to get pursued at because uh, everything's going digital and yeah. streaming. Yeah. So mm. streaming is very yeah. important. And as songwriters, um, you know, we work with organizations like Neris and NSAI that are helping lobby in Washington, D.C. every day on behalf of us to get the streaming rates raised. So it is getting worked on. It's a slow process, as you can imagine. But yes, he's, Jericho's right. The streaming is something that as songwriters we've got to get on board with. And ultimately, for consumers, it's a great thing. Like, I love Spotify. I love Apple Music. Like, the fact that we can just pull up anything anywhere, and it's such a great discovery tool. So good answer there. Uh, Logan, do you have suggestions for marketing or social media? Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> The, the simple answer is that really you guys just have to prioritize it. That's really what it comes down to. I mean, there's you know all sorts of tips and tricks out there, but it, it is just a matter of prioritizing. You guys have learned you know at this retreat how it can be really, really critical to schedule in time for songwriting. And like Jenny said last night, time to learn your instrument and get better on that. In the same way, um, we were just talking this morning, like marketing is probably 50%, if not more, of the battle uh, for a music career because you have to have the awesome product but then you have to have the awesome marketing to get it out to people. Um, so really, you know, again, there, there are tips and tricks but the, but the real answer is you just have to take time, put it on a calendar if you have to and learn it. Learn email marketing, marketing automation, social media, advertising, do what you have to do, spend money on courses. Um, but just, you know, it's not rocket science. It's something that you guys can Google and figure out. It's just something that you truly have to invest time into to learn and that's really what it's going to take. Yeah, good answer. Yeah, marketing. I, it's it's funny. I've I've kind of uh, pulled a 180 on my view of that because I when I first moved to Nashville, I mean I moved here as an artist and songwriter and creative, and I'm like, man, if the song's good, right? Like everybody should just it, gravitate towards it, right? Wrong. It's actually not that case at all. You've got to have a great song regardless. That is the baseline. But you also have to have people that are constantly nudge, nudge, nudge. You got to hear this song. You got to hear this band. You got to check that, check out this video. You got to see them live. You got to blah blah blah, and it's all about what I find. A lot of us as songwriters don't want to be self promoty or markety or feel like feel like we're salesy. I personally ha have struggled with that and still struggle with that and have to figure out ways that are genuine to me, where I'm not coming off like I'm just trying to sell something. Um, but the reality is, is you've got to figure out how to communicate your ideas and your passions to people. Um, and the one thing that I've learned lately is it's about nudge, nudge, nudge. Like, you cannot say the same thing too many times over and over again. People are busy. I mean, like, social media feeds are just rapid fire. You just swipe, swipe through. And um, so don't be afraid to say your message over and over and over again in different ways and different. Yeah, so I'm, that was a great question. I'm, I'm glad that got asked in a room full of songwriters because it's as important to brand yourself as a songwriter as it is. Uh, to brand yourself as an artist or anything. So, great question. Uh, this one's for me. Do you think it's possible for a songwriter to have a successful career while not living in Nashville versus another city? I want to zoom out a little bit and first of all focus on that word, success. Like, define success. <clears throat> what is success in the first place? Is success making hundred thousand dollars a year off of your songs? Is it making enough to pay the bills so that you can do what you love to do? Is it just being able to do it part-time? Like success really is such a subjective word and it depends on where you live too because I mean if you're living in a small town in Iowa success might mean having one hit a year and then that pays for your whole year because it's so much cheaper to live there than like LA or Nashville. Um, success for some people might not mean financially at all. It might just mean literally getting to do as much songwriting as you want to do. Um, we interviewed one of our industry mentors, his name's Andy Karp, ran uh, Atlantic Records on the mainstream side for 
I don't know how, how long, 10, 20 years. So he's, he's got a wealth of, yeah, 15, wealth of uh, just industry experience. We're actually putting together in a, a one day event um, that will be him just essentially dropping all of his knowledge from like signing acts like Kid Rock, working with, you know, uh, Blues Traveler, uh, Uncle Cracker, uh, Skillet, who we met him through, and his records have sold like 50 million records. So we, we kind of dove in pretty heavy on a, a, a conversation with him recently, and um, we talked about this too, but like, he put it really good. He, how many of you ever heard of a band called Simple Plan? Is anybody? So probably like not every, like 30% of the room. You know, they had a big run still humongous in Japan and Singapore, kind of a, you know, early 2000s pop punk thing. And I was like, oh, I just figured they would have disappeared. But he's like, no, they, they just tour whenever they want. Like, they have families, they've got wives and kids, and they make a living. Like, if, if, if you're young and your, your idea of success is, by the time I'm whatever age, 40, 50, if I can be making music and making a living at it, and I can be with my family, then, for them, that's success. Um, even though they're not on the top of the radio charts, like they haven't had a hit in years. But just like uh, the Hunter Brothers were talking about, you know, for an artist, success can just mean having a long-term touring career that allows you to just keep writing songs and having a cre creative outlet. So I think the big key is defining really clearly for you, and, and this, this is something for you guys to, to spend some time doing, whether it's today or on your way home or um, th throughout this week, Write it out on paper. In your perfect world, what would success look like for you as a songwriter? And I think that's a huge thing. I love, Natalie sets a great example of that at just such a young age of knowing, I want to go for Broadway. Like, I want to write songs like Al Minkin, and that's, you know, that's, that's a great uh, goal to have. So I think having clear defined goals of success. Um, so all that to say, I don't know that Nashville matters as much. I think the key is just having community wherever you're at. So whether that's in your home church, um, I, we see that all the time. We work with churches like Elevation, and we've done stuff with Bethel that are absolutely not in Nashville. But they are so influential um, in the worship space. Um, it's, it, but they have an incredible community that is just constantly writing and creating and um, you know, mentoring each other and helping each other along. So if you're from a small town, I think the best thing that you can do, because chances are there's probably not a strong st songwriting community there, best thing that you can do is step out of your comfort zone and start one. A um, lot of us are afraid, like, man, like, shouldn't I be, like, farther along or have hits or whatever to be able to, like, mentor other people? No, not at all. Like, I think you should always be mentoring somebody and being mentored by somebody, no matter where you're at in your career. Every one of you guys should find somebody. Like, now leaving, you're 15, find a 12-year-old to mentor. Like, you know, or find an 18-year-old to mentor, you know? Like, age doesn't matter. It's just uh, success doesn't matter. I think, I think doing that automatically creates a creative community around you. So even if you live in a town of 1,800 people, chances are there's one or two or three other people that would probably like meeting up with you once a month and writing songs. And so that can be a big, uh, big part. And we encourage people to do that a lot. So. That was a very good question, but um, yes, we'll move on to the next one. Stacy, how and where do you find new artists? Well, I, I was thinking about this earlier. I don't think there's ever been a time where I have sat on the computer and, and scrolled through SoundCloud or Spotify, me personally, maybe there's other people that have, but for me and my 20 years of doing this, it's always been about relationships. It's always been about uh, a PRO, BMI, ASCAP, or CSAC calling saying, hey, we, we, we met with this, this kid the other day, and he's amazing. You should, you should check him out. Or a, an attorney um, calls, or a manager, or I'm at Frothy Monkey having a cup of coffee, and I see a friend, and they're having you know, they're having coffee with, with a, a songwriter or an artist and they introduce me to that person and, oh, you should check them out. And so then I might go back and, and, and take a look. But normally it's, it's about the relationships that, that I have, that the community, you know, you find out about people through, through your friends, through your um, community of 
managers, artists. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, good. Yeah. Mike Murray said that yesterday on the panel. You know, he's going to listen to something if me or Stacy or extra Derek or Logan send it to him. You know, as opposed to just getting something out of the blue. Um, yeah, again, that was that was nugget of gold. Don't stalk him in Kroger. So, <laughs> uh, X, what is it like to work with popular bands? That's a good question. Yeah, getting the fun ones. I yeah, I got my desert, <laughs> desert island thing. I got my popular bands guy going. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's fun. I think throughout making music, I've had a chance to work with artists that I've either grown up listening to, or have just been, you know, fan like sudden fans of their music. One thing comes to mind: uh, there's this artist, uh, Robert Randolph, and the Family Band. I had literally just seen him play on the Tonight Show, and I'm sitting in the studio two days later, and the guy I was working with at the time was like, "Hey, I gotta leave. I'm gonna have dinner with this guy. They want us to maybe make a record with them." I was like, okay, cool. And I thought this dude was awesome. I was mind blown watching him play. And then two hours later, he come, uh, the guy I was working with comes walking in and behind him is Robert Randolph. And he's like, hey, this is this guy, Robert. He's a steel player, you know, we might do a record with him. I was like, dude, I saw you play on The Tonight Show a couple days ago. <laughs> and at the time, Robert was like, no one really knew who he was. His first record had been out for a little while. And he was like, he was the most humble dude. He's like, oh, thank, thanks, man, you know. Yeah, I was like, no, this, this is great. This is so cool. Um, but then after that, it was kind of like, let's get, down to, let's get down to business. You know, we're here to, to make music. And I, I think, like we talked about last night, in the, in the rooms, there's no hierarchy of this person's in charge, that person's in charge. We're all just there out of a mutual respect for each other, and we're there to make you know, something cool and creative. And as producers, we're there to help uh, artists fulfill their visions and take their visions even further down the field so I think we kind of all have this cool symbiotic relationship of like hey we're just all forming this one thing so you know sometimes you know as I've gotten older I've learned to like keep it on the inside a little bit more so maybe I'm giggling on the ride home or something but for the most part it's just like you know hey good to meet you um, you know we sit down and we we get to work, and the, the funniest thing is like when you, ha when you meet really established artists or people that have found a lot of success, it's shocking. Y you would almost think people that are new and so hungry to do stuff would be the easiest ones to work with, but a lot of times it's those people that have been doing it for so long that you would almost expect attitudes out of, where they just sit down, there's, no there's nothing. They're just like, what do we need to do? Let's do this thing, and you just, you just go, and it's, it's great. It's an awesome experience. So I hope that answered the question a little bit. But. Yeah, that's a great answer. I mean, <clears throat> even just talking about, you know, guys that we've gotten to work with, like Michael W. Smith, I, I don't know, you know, what your perception of it was, but when he came in, um, I, I don't know what I had built up in my head, but he's one of these legends that I had grown up listening to. A lot of people even, you know, outside the church world know who he is. Um, yeah. He's just had a massive career, but he came in and it was just like, probably the easiest session that we've ever did yeah and he you know how many vocal takes did he do not many yeah yeah <laughs> but he and did do his own delay he did he actually he's saying his own that. delays he's in a few spots and was very good at it because he seth actually looked at me he's like i like that delay i was like that wasn't me <laughs> and he's, then uh, what sorry what were you saying no, I no. Go ahead. I, oh, I was gonna say the only other two times that really come to mind was the John Foreman time. Yeah. Because I grew up listening to Switchfoot. Yeah, incredible. You hear him sing like it's so funny to like you hear it coming through the speakers and Seth and I just looked at each other and we're like, yeah, that's the voice, that's yeah. the one right there. And then the Dan Tominsky thing, same yeah. way. Yeah. Dan, for those of you who don't know Dan, he uh, anyone see uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou the movie? Dan is the voice, the singing voice of George Clooney in that movie and so he's a songwriter in Nashville just had a record come out and Seth wrote a song with him and we we produced up a demo for it and when you hear him sing it's like there it is that's that voice right there holy cow this is awesome yeah and again just so stellar yeah and and I I also think of Ricky Skaggs too I don't know how many of you guys are into bluegrass or so good. you know something gospel and that kind of stuff but uh he was certainly a, a name in our house growing up in southern Ohio and so he came over to sing on a High Valley record that we were working on a couple of years ago and again was just the sweetest, uh, probably most spiritual person I've ever met. Just very, like the conversations were very God focused, very, he's very charismatic, very knowledgeable on scriptures and my wife came upstairs because I wanted her to meet him and she was pregnant with our first one and he just sees her and he says, oh, can I just, can I just uh, anoint your, your baby? 
So he lays hands on my wife's stomach and prays for our, you know, first child. So she's three years old now. She's been prayed for by Ricky Skaggs. So I, I'm just waiting for her to like bust out a mandolin solo. <laughs> she picks it up in the control room every like, once in a while. Like, this might be the time. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> So I, 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 I honestly can't think of an experience that I've had something built up in my head and been let down by, yeah. you know, usually, you know, people that have long standing careers have that for a reason. It's because they're good people, they treat people well, and they're hardworking. They're hardworking, yeah. So that's great. It's a great question. Uh, Jericho, how could I influence my community and bring the excellence from Full Circle Music home? Mm. I gave you the coffee, right? <laughs> Drink our coffee and you will write hits. Do we travel? No. Um, uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I think the simple answer for that is, um, besides laughing, is I don't know, just kind of grasping the the hopefully. You've seen it, the servant attitude. I mean, I mean, I think that's probably the biggest aspect of it. It's not necessarily like what we do or anything like that. Like we're just hoping to serve you guys um, and get you guys closer to what you guys are achieving, just from what we've experienced or learned ourselves and that kind of stuff. And so it's the same kind of philosophy. Um, just hopefully you guys can take that and. Uh, put that into something else in your guys' own personal life. And it doesn't even necessarily mean music related. I mean, it's literally anything. Um, I mean, some of you guys are even going to church after this, you know what I'm saying? So it's just even, uh, just my take would just be really the servant's heart kind of attitude, um, loving everybody, uh, and just going, yeah, beyond what you think you can do for somebody else. Because originally, with this whole mentality of doing an academy, it's kind of like, yeah, when do we have time for that? And like all of us are super excited to be a, like to do this. We're, like every time one ends, we're like, all right, when's the next one? Yeah. You know what I mean? So exactly. it's like, um, I mean, just that kind of mentality is just like loving your neighbor and what can you do for them to yeah. get them closer to what they want to achieve. It's good. And, and Stacy kind of just joked too to that question, what can you do to take you know full circle music home? Well, you can literally take us home with you. Bye. Subscribing to our YouTube page. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Music so, production mastery course. Yeah. So you, but seriously though, um, that's why we do those things because we know like what it's like when you get back home and you're like, I just need some inspiration. I need to hear that I'm not crazy because it probably feels like you're crazy some days. Um, but seriously, if if you're not already subscribed, just make a note or do it even like right now on your phone. Go to our YouTube page. We put out stuff every single week. So that's a way you can virtually take us home with you to your community. So. Search YouTube for Full Circle Academy. Yeah, thank you, Logan. And, and you have you and you have each other. Like, make sure you leave here with getting you yeah. know names and numbers and and Diaz. Yeah, maybe some people in your community might not understand, especially if you're from a small town. I totally get that. But you all have ex had this three days together, and you understand the experience you've just gone through. So you know when you need that encouragement. You know, check in with one of your buddies that you've met here this weekend, and and just be an encouragement to each other. Yeah, keep the keep the community, and definitely make an effort, because it's it's easy when you get home to sort of forget about that. But you've had this incredible experience that, of course, everybody who's been in this room for the weekend will understand. So, take advantage of that, and make sure to stay in touch with people. Uh, Logan, with the change in the way people are consuming music, what media tools could an artist use to help influence their career? I mean, obviously, we're, we have moved into a world of streaming. And I mean, the, it's kind of simple where you definitely can't beat it, uh, so you need to join it. Um, it was the same thing when you know, iTunes came around and, and all this digital distribution happened versus CDs. And so it's like, OK, now it's, well, I, at that time, it was, how do I climb iTunes charts? And so now it's, how do I you know, climb Spotify charts? And how do I um, you know, get on playlists? And so really, as far as specific tools, like I would just say that this tool is Spotify itself. It is, um, 
currently easier to gain specific ground on Spotify versus um, some of the other ones. But, you know, we have a podcast. Um, if you just search Spotify and our Full Circle Music Show podcast, we have a whole podcast that really goes deep into Spotify strategies towards actually getting on playlists and, you know, really generating streams out of that. Um, so, yeah, so as far as, like, the new music industry and tools, like, I would just say, you know, study Spotify itself. Again, commit time to learn specific Spotify strategies and tactics. At the same time, as far as other tools, um, just don't, don't get so absorbed in that world that you're forgetting to think outside of the box because it's also the people who just, you know, do something really creative and then you find out about them later and you're like, oh, I really wish I had done that. Um, but yeah, think outside of the box. Get, you know, find what other marketers are doing outside of music and copy what they're doing. Or is there someone who just has a really good YouTube channel that has nothing to do with music? Is there someone who has a really good blog? Someone who has a great podcast, someone who, you know, look at what they're doing on TV shows. Look at whatever people are doing to generate a following. And if you can, you know, copy or implement something that they're doing that helps you generate a following. At the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's about generating a following. And, and that's how you win. Yeah, it's that Tim Timmons said the other night on the panel. It's audience, audience, audience. And that's, one of, that's been one of the big things I've learned. Um, since Logan started working with us, there's so many uh, tools out there that most artists just are doing a really bad job at either not either just not using or they don't know how to use them properly. Um, and maybe talk about just some of the things that we use, even just as far as like lead digits. People may sure. not even know well, what yeah, that and, is. Well, yeah, and I'll I'll say too, there's a lot of tools out there. Um, I, I don't want to name any specifics, but. Uh, with with like kind of older tools that you know that this kind of independent music idea has you know been a, a recent phenomenon in, in the last decade where people kind of can do it themselves. But that said, there are a lot of tools that kind of cater to um, independent musicians that may have started like like a decade ago or so. And just sometimes be careful of those because a lot of them. Are, are, are for independent musicians and aren't necessarily going to help you really generate a following. It might help you get a little bit more money for, you know, 10 streams that happen to come through on Spotify. But, but ju just be careful with a lot of those kind of tools. Think outside of the box of, um, again, I, I would encourage you to, to try and follow what marketers are doing versus just what kind of other independent musicians are doing. Um, so yeah, so that said, with specific tools, um, we use yeah, Lead Pages, which um, has a feature called Lead Digits which allows you to get people to opt into your email list at shows if you just give them a, um, a word to text to a number. Um, and yeah, we, we use email marketing through GetResponse. Um, all of our sales come through SamCart. Uh, you know, we, we use Facebook ads and Google ads and all that kind of stuff. Um, anything else I'm missing? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I, that was a great nugget. I hope, I hope you guys wrote that down. Don't just follow other musicians, follow marketers. Because they're the ones who actually know how to do this stuff. So, a lot of the musicians that we meet know, you know, they know Gary Vaynerchuk and they know Pat Flynn and they know these guys. And so I, I thought that was great. So yeah, I, I, I would say, man, the lead digit thing has just been powerful even for us. Every time we go and do an event, um, it's as simple as saying text songwriting to four four two two two, and then the audience texts it in. They can opt in right there, get on your email list. And if you're an artist and you don't have an email list, you need to start one. Start one, like yeah. before you leave today. Yeah, yeah. And Logan is, is the ninja of email lists, so he can give you his advice on that. I'd be more than happy to talk about Yeah, if anyone has questions about specific tools, come and ask me if you're here or if you're listening on the podcast, Logan at fullcirclemusic.com. Yeah, exactly. It's good. Um, for myself, how do you balance work, free time, and family time? Wow, that, well, that's that's a that's a tough one. I mean, us as creatives, how many of you guys, after you left last night, went home and had trouble like falling asleep because you've got all these ideas? <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine, the same is going to be true when you go home and you got your your wife or your husband and your kids or your your, your family, whoever's around you, your friends. Um, you can imagine the same is true for that. That you've got these ideas flowing through your head. But let me tell you this. They're going to be there tomorrow. Just don't be afraid to turn your phone off. Um, I think in this world, to, to contrast this whole you know, marketing thing, we've also got to take time to unplug from that stuff, too. Social media is extremely important. Marketing is extremely important. But even more important than all of that is your own personal headspace and relationships. 
So one thing that we do is, in, in my house, just no phones at the dinner table. We don't do that. Because um, if you get a text, your, your brain just goes, oh, you, get, you, know, you see who texted me. And what am I missing out on? And uh, so we use airplane mode a ton after like 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock every night. These guys know that if, the only, if there's a way to get a hold of me, it's pretty much setting the house on fire. And don't do that. But uh, <laughs> but we're, we're, I'm pretty unreachable. So just being OK with that, um, I think you've got to develop routines. It's really important in my family. We, we try to keep a pretty strict 9 to 5 schedule every day, which I know is fairly rare among producers and songwriters. They, you know, most of us in this community aren't great at doing that. And that's why we see so many broken families and broken relationships. And um, it's just, let me tell you, any success that you'll ever achieve is not worth sacrificing that. It's just not. It's just absolutely not. So prioritize that before anything. Obviously, get good at your craft. But if you feel like that side of things, that your family relationships are slipping, Throw all that other stuff away for, for a season. You know, take a take a break from it. So, for me, it's just it's all about priorita prioritization and perspective. Unfortunately, I married a girl from Sweden, and Sweden is like the king of, um, you know, you don't you don't live to work, you work to live. It's it's a different mentality than it is here in the states, and so she's rubbed off on me in a good way. So that was a great question. Whoever asked that, Stacy, have you ever worked with an artist based on unsolicited material? Or are referrals the key? Referrals are the key. I don't, I cannot remember a time that I found an artist through an unsolicited um, material or, yeah. you know, that way. So it's always been through relationships, always been through referrals. Um, yeah, I can't remember yeah. a time that I've it's been anything other than that. Again, relationships, relationships, relationships. It is really the key to one of the, one of the major keys to this industry. It's just all about, um, it, and you, do, you just don't know, like it's funny with having Mike Murray here yesterday. I mean, he was my assistant when I was at EMI Christian. <clears throat> and you just, you never know who you're gonna be um, in the room with. You don't know, yeah. they may be your boss next next year <laughs> yeah. so it's all about relationships or you may be Rel theirs or you may be their their <laughs> boss so relationships are key and then that's that's really how how we work with other songwriters and other artists it's good x when should i start contacting people about my songs to get them produced and or on the radio that's a that's a heavy question right there <laughs> um that's a good question though i think you don't want to go too soon with it. I think something we talked about last night was having filters, you know, having people around you that you can trust. And I think Ginny even made a nice point with knowing who you necessarily not can't trust, but just maybe shouldn't always hear the opinion of. I know I definitely have some of those influences around myself as well. So I think it's a matter of getting your songs through a few filters to where you feel like, okay, I'm at the level now where I feel like it's worth spending that investment in getting it fully produced out. And whether that's going a few rounds of passing your stuff through filters and sharing with friends. And now, like, like we've been talking about during this, this panel, you've got you know, 14 other people here that are on the same plane as you. you know, this is where the relationship building begins. It even goes to the, the, the coaches you've had. You, know? you have that contact now, and you've sat in a room with them. So you've got that extra relationship already started, bouncing the ideas off there. And once you feel like it's come down to its purest form, I think that's when you're able to reach out to a producer on that end if you're looking to get it produced out and then let them take it up to the next level. As far as going to radio with it, I think that can kind of be even further down the road. Whether you're producing it out yourself, it's about, as again, like Seth and I talked about last night, referencing other stuff, seeing how you, your song, your like sonic quality the message, everything holds up against other stuff that's out there because this is a highly competitive, you know, field of music. Because with with streaming, there's no like there's genres, but there's really not anymore. With streaming, it's like we're playing a playlist that has country, Christian music, rap, every like it's all out there for everyone. So you're not just competing against, you know, this like really niche little market or something. You're competing against 
millions of people. So if you're wanting to go to radio and to push singles out, you need to make sure that what you're delivering is on par with what's already out there and then better. So I would say keep going through filters, establish the relationships, get it produced out, but never stop referencing, being inspired by other people and pushing yourself to make the, the best sounding and, and the greatest impacting message that you can. The internet and Spotify and media is the greatest and the worst thing ever because once you put something out, it's there forever. Yep. You can take it down, but it probably exists somewhere. So case in point, I have a video where I look like an idiot driving around on a scooter in my music video that I did. And that is out there forever. <laughs> my daughter actually loves it, and it's actually kind of a funny video. But <laughs> what X said is so true. You, you, you really want to make sure that your stuff is vetted, um, even if vetting means creating a, let's call it focus group around you of yeah. 10 or 15 or 20 people that you trust um, that you can bounce your stuff off of. And that's so good. It's, it goes back to the filters. It goes back to the the demo discussion that we talked about last night, make masters, not demos. Um, I, I think you're, you'll serve your career in the long run by thinking that way. So Jericho, getting down to the last couple questions. What are mm. some tips for breaking through writer's block? Well, I'll let you piggy on this. Uh, the first answer would just be don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, what I mean by that is like, um, if you see yourself heading that direction, change what you're doing. Like if you're having trouble lyrically, start working on the track. If you're having trouble on the track, uh, start working on it lyrically. If you're in a co-write, start talking. Like uh, start finding out what's going on and that kind of stuff. Find out the inspiration of the song and think back on that or whatever. Um, for some reason you're by yourself. Just take a break. Or even if you're in a co-write, there's nothing wrong with that. Go have breakfast, or if it's later on, that's when you go to take a lunch. Like, take breaks. There's nothing wrong with that. Read a book. Do something. Whatever, like, inspires you or motivates you, there's nothing wrong to reflect back on those moments. Um, and especially in the co-writing, that the time to communicate are in those moments. Um, and you feed off each other. But don't hesitate, though. Like, when you see something coming... And like, if you feel yourself coming to like, uh oh, I see the wall coming, change what you're doing. Um, that way you can kind of divert around that. Yeah. Stacy, you've, you've probably worked with, I would say in the hundreds of songwriters over the years. What, what would be your advice to that? I mean, he said some good things. I think, you know, taking a break, um, reading, <laughs> reading books, uh, going to movies, Paying attention to the people that are around you. I've heard story after story of people going to Cracker Barrel or going to a restaurant or going to a coffee shop, and they're just sitting there listening to the conversations around them and getting ideas for songs from the people that they're around. Um, airports. Pay attention to airports. Like, you know, you're sitting there, you're on your phone. Maybe put your phone down and just... Pay attention to the stories that are happening around you. Um, and then another thing that uh, I've, I think it actually it was Alex Seeley, our pastor, um, brought this up in a, in a songwriting event that we were having. But if you're having trouble in the room um, you, with your co-writer not being able to come up with something, take a moment and just go into worship. Just take, you know, take five, 15 minutes and just the, between the, you know, two or the three of you guys and just, just enter in and let the Holy Spirit kind of move and see what happens, see what comes from that, that, uh, that time of worship. And yeah. I know Mia Fields has, has done that as well. And, and they've been able to like come up with a, you know, in that space, you allow the Holy Spirit to kind of move and, yeah. and, and, you know, direct you to a, to a word or to a thought. So those yeah. are just some kind of little nuggets. It's good. And the one thing I would add to that is just read a lot if you don't. If you're not a reader, become a reader. That's kind of what I had to do, and I love reading now. So read guys like C.S. Lewis, J.R. Tolkien, all the classics. There's so much uh, just inspiration to be gleaned from there. So um, we're down to our last question. I'll have Logan start this one off. And then we can kind of just go down the line. What is your favorite thing about working at Full Circle Music? 
There are a lot of answers, but I'll, I'll go ahead and say um, just that I really like our our startup culture around here and our ability to innovate. I think that that's you know a really great thing about having a small company. For instance, you know there's a lot of bigger companies out there in music and in other things, but um, but but if you're too big, it can be hard to maneuver and and do things quickly. So yeah, I, I love the, the the fact that we can kind of come up with an idea on a Monday and then make something happen on a Tuesday. And um, yeah, there's just always things to, to try that we're not afraid to try, and it's, it's nice to have that environment. Yeah, good. Um, I, guess I, I guess we'll just go backwards. <laughs> yeah, saucy. Yeah, you can't uh, tell, by I, the way, if you're not listening to the, if you're listening on a podcast, you won't, this doesn't apply to you, but if you're watching on YouTube, we're gonna start a band called the Red Flannel Brigade. <laughs> <laughs> so we did not get the memo, yeah, the record comes out next memo. year. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Um, what I what was what was the question? What was my favorite thing? Favorite thing about working at Full Circle Music? Um, Me? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we just can't kidding. clearly <laughs> say yeah, Stacy. Yeah. I, 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 I was gonna say Jericho, yeah. so you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, realistically, though, I like being the dumbest guy that works here, um, <laughs> because I like learning every day. So I just surround myself with smarter people than me. Man. And yeah, that's then I good. learn every day. Yeah, top that, guys. Hey, actually, that's, that's good. That's I'm good. not gonna try to top it, but I'm gonna try to elaborate on it. Um, I think I think what Jericho said is kind of similar to what I'm gonna say. But I, the one thing I do love is that we all have what I would probably call a standard of excellence, and that we all push each other to not settle for just like, oh, that's fine. It's like, no, that's not fine. Is that the coolest best thing we can do if the answer is no then it's not going to happen like we've we've started you know podcasts and videos and academies and all this stuff and you know we're we've never done any of this stuff but at the same time we we i love that we none of us use that as an excuse to just pass it off as like oh that's fine you know it's like no it needs to be this is the thought this is the vision of it this is what it needs to be this is yeah, it's, it could still reach people, but is it going to impact, like, this is, this is us putting ourselves out there. We, you know, it's kind of like, you know, dressing to impress or whatever. You're putting your best self forward, and I love that that's the quality that we all share. And because it just drives you to be better. It's like, you know, when Seth and I are producing, it's like if something's not right, he, he tells me or I tell him, and that we're sharpening each other. We're trying to push the best thing out. Like with videos you know logan will be like well this isn't said right you know it needs to be said more like this or you know what if we tried talking more like this and it's just you know it's criticism but it's constructive at the same time and that's that's what i love is that we're you know while we're all friends and like almost like family it's we still push each other to be the absolute best we can be yeah that's good yes that's so good everything that they said and i and i also think that you know i just love all of our servants hearts I love that um, when we're in meetings, um, one of the things that is my really my takeaway from Full Circle is, is it's not about what uh, we can get from those people. It's really about how can we serve you. And I've worked in the industry for a long time, and this is, this is my heart, but it's not necessarily how I've done business in the past, and I have in thoroughly enjoyed the leadership of, of Full Circle of, of being in meetings with, you know, major artists or major companies and being able to say, hey, how can we partner with you? How can we support you? Instead of having that meeting thinking, what can we get from you? We yeah. leave that meeting and, yeah. and, and it's, and we've just seen God just open up doors because of that servant's heart. Yeah. And, um, it's a partnership. It's a, it's a team. And, and, uh, that's yeah. probably one of the things that I love the most about what we all do. I mean, all of us do it. It's just a, a servant's heart that we all have. So good. And I'll, I'll kind of close out by saying there's, there's really kind of three things that come to mind for me is, and, and I'll piggyback on what X said, um, the best thing that I love about our dare to suck mentality is that it creates a safe place. I, I've, I can't tell you how many artists have come in and just said, like, just even sitting in that, sitting in the room, it just feels, you just feel at ease. You feel relaxed. You feel like you can be yourself. You feel like you can decompress. Um, and so 
in order to constructively uh, you know, sharpen each other and, you, and use constructive criticism, you have to have a safe environment to do that to where um, if Logan corrects me when I'm doing a video, I'm not going to say, no, you're wrong. I'm going to say, oh, that's, that's actually a good point. I should probably change that. Even though I am wrong sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. But um, it's a safe place. And I, I also love that it's a, it's a culture of no excuses. Um, I think we kind of just figure it out. Like, like X said, none of us have ever done this before. Like, we don't know how to put on an academy. We don't know how to do a podcast. We don't know how to do a webinar. We're not public speakers. We're not, you know, but at one point we were never music producers. We were also never songwriters. Um, so it's just a culture of no excuses. Like, I mean, I got to brag on Stacy. like us starting a label and a publishing company. She has done so many things that uh, I've asked her to do or that, that have just needed done that she never had any experience doing before, but she just learned how to do it. And it wasn't necessarily that it was even in her quote unquote job description. Uh, job descriptions around here are a little bit, a little bit uh, meaningless. You know, we like them to have on business cards and they can sound impressive when you meet somebody. But around here, we kind of each do a little bit of everything. And we don't make excuses when something um, needs done, even down to, you know, I mean, X is VP of production. He was sweeping up the floors last night. Like, it's just, you, you, it's, it's a very, uh, very much a culture of um, just uh, when, when there's a job that needs done, we do it. And the last thing I would say, and I, I'll borrow this from one of the uh, mentors that I listen to, Andy Stanley. If you guys are not familiar with him, check him out. But um, he talks about this idea of a culture of continued improvement. And I wrote that on our whiteboard in there just because I love it so much. And really, that's about, and that, and that can be applied in your family. That can be applied in your band. It can be applied at your church, at your job, at your work. And really, that is um, about creating momentum. And momentum comes from three things. It comes from doing something new, it comes from improving something, or it comes from something that you've improved. It's new, improved, or improving. And I feel like we're always, like every single time we do a new thing and then we do it again, it's better the next time. We never go backwards. Because if you go backwards, you're, or if you stagnate, you're going backwards. There is no just sitting. It's always improving. So I think that's what I love about just the amazing team that we've built here and um, really just the incredible songwriters just like you guys that show up at these events. It's, it's a testament to that. So um, I think you know, like attracts like, and we've seen a lot of really, really great, talented people come through the doors, so um, that's what I love about Full Circle Music. And I think that concludes our Full Circle Music panel, so thank you for being such a great live studio audience here. Hey, this is Seth Mosley here at Full Circle Music Academy Songwriters Retreat. Thank you for tuning in. This is Full Circle Music Show. Uh, produced by the Full Circle Media Company. And we just would love to thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for all your good ratings and reviews on iTunes. That helps us a ton. Hit subscribe on YouTube and uh, subscribe to us on iTunes as well. And we'd love to hear from you. We always say this in every podcast, but send us an email to support at fullcirclemusic.com if you have any questions at all. Um, we want to know you. We want to connect with you. And we want to help you solve your problems and struggles and help you navigate this crazy music industry. So again, you can email us anytime at support at fullcirclemusic.com and um, follow us on our social media as well. Our handle across all platforms is at officialfcmusic. So uh, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week.